approaching tachycardia and breaking down the ACLS algorithm. Whenever I see a tachycardic patient, I use this algorithm. The first branch point in the algorithm is, is the tachycardia narrow or is it wide? The reason we have branch points is because we are marking a divergence in either the management or the treatment of a disease. Here we will focus on the management of narrow complex tachycardias and we will talk about wide complex in a different lecture, understanding that usually wide complex tachycardias are treated as VTAC until proven otherwise. Wide complex tachycardias can be a little nuanced, but we'll talk about that later. The next branch point in narrow complex tachycardias is is the tachycardia stable or is it unstable? Understanding that stable narrow complex tachycardias get medicine, whereas unstable narrow complex tachycardias get Edison or electricity. But before we go down that branch point, let's first talk about what makes patients unstable. It's one of four things. All of these four are signs of end organ dysfunction. So one of them is end organ dysfunction of the circulatory system or low blood pressure. So blood pressure less than 100 or hypotension. The other is end organ dysfunction at the heart or chest pain concerning for ACS or could be aortic dissection as well. So this is not some pokey pokey seconds of chest pain. This is a chest pain story that is good and consistent with uh, ACS or aortic dissection. The third is end organ dysfunction at the brain, which is evidenced by altered mental status. And lastly, we're looking for signs of pulmonary edema or signs of acute heart failure. If your patient is not exhibiting one of these four things in the initial stages, then you can confidently approach them as a stable patient. So stable patients get medicine, but in this narrow complex tachycardia algorithm, we do one little thing before we try medicines. Here we have the option of trying vagal maneuvers. However, before we try vagal maneuvers or give medicines, we go down the algorithm in one more branch point. And this branch point helps us understand and figure out what kind of narrow complex tachycardia we're dealing with. And so that next branch point is we want to know if the tachycardia is regular or if it's irregular. There are a number of regular and irregular narrow complex tachycardias, but I want you to remember at least three from each category. The first one you want to remember is sinus tachycardia. The next one that's regular is AVRT or AVNRT, which we sometimes colloquially refer to as SVT, and lastly, a flutter with a fixed block, usually a two to one block. In the irregular column, you want to remember a fib, MFAT or multifocal atrial tachycardia, and a flutter with a variable block. So the most common irregular narrow complex tachycardia is going to be AFib. So when in doubt, think about AFib. Um, and multi, uh, multifocal atrial tachycardia is when you have three different P waves. And lastly, atrial flutter with a variable block is kind of rare, so don't default to thinking that all irregular narrow complex tachycardias are A flutter. Think about AFib first.
So when I'm approaching my tachycardic patient, I try to figure out which one of these six uh, tachycardias does this patient have. Because knowing that will help me understand if I need to do a vagal maneuver or if I need to give uh, medicine to help slow the rate down. The medicines we have are four main medications. Adenosine, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and amiodarone. And each one of these medications are used in very specific scenarios. For example, adenosine, I only use it in one of two scenarios. When I have diagnostic certainty that I'm dealing with a quote-unquote SVT or AVRT or AVNRT, or when the heart rate is going so fast that I can't tell if it's regular or irregular. Adenosine is both therapeutic and diagnostic in AVRT or AVNRT. For everything else on this list, if you have an adenosine effect, it'll slow the rate down and then it'll go right back up to what it was before. You have to make sure you gave adenosine the right way. So make sure you have a stopcock, a three-way stopcock, and that you're giving it through uh, IV that's good in the antecubital fossa. But you also need to make sure that you see a pause on the monitor. If you don't see a pause, then you didn't give it fast enough or you didn't give it the right way. And you can't really say adenosine didn't work. Once I know which tachycardia I'm dealing with, then I know how to treat it. For example, if we're dealing with sinus tach, I need to sit back and think, is this a compensatory response to an underlying infection or an underlying hypovolemic event? If so, then you end up treating that. right? So get fluids, antibiotics, etc. If I'm dealing with a fib or a flutter, I still want to stop and think to make sure that this isn't a compensatory response to some underlying hypovolemic event or distributive shock from sepsis. Uh, you want to make sure that the tank is full uh, before you rate control. So if this is a compensatory response to a hypovolemia from a GI bleed, that you want to make sure you stop the GI bleed and you replenish the blood uh, before you rate control. Which rate controlling agent you use is really nuanced, uh, but we usually end up using a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. Uh, you'll notice that in the emergency room, you see physicians you more, use more calcium channel blockers. That's because rate control is achieved more quickly with calcium channel blockers. But on the inpatient side, you'll see medicine and cardiologists use beta blockers more because a lot of these patients have underlying coronary artery disease and uh, beta blockers are preferred in that scenario. But they both have the same efficacy. Amiodarone is used in patients that may have soft blood pressures or are not as hemodynamically stable as we would like. But understand that with amiodarone, we run the risk of rhythm controlling somebody, and therefore you may need to anticoagulate in this scenario if you use amiodarone. So now that we've gone through the stable portion of the algorithm, we quickly need to go and understand the unstable portion of the algorithm. Patients that are unstable and have a narrow complex tachycardia get electricity in the form of a synchronized shock starting at 100 joules. Here we are assuming the patient has a pulse, because if they were pulseless, we would be in the ACLS pulseless algorithm. And we also need to remember that all patients with a pulse get synchronized shocks to avoid the R on T phenomenon. And please remember that while your patient may be unstable, they may still be alert enough to feel the shock. So think about sedating them prior to the shock if there is time. If there's no time, Shock it out.
but if you have some time, uh, sedation with uh, half dose etomidate or pain control with fentanyl is preferred. And that's my approach to tachycardia. Uh, try to use this as often as you can on your tachycardic patients so that it becomes second nature and you can quickly work your way down the algorithm to figure out what you're going to need to do diagnostically and therapeutically.